Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us live. And Danny from New Jersey is actually on location in Florida. So you guys can ask him all the questions that you want with his rare, rare birds and amazing creatures. He's flapping up a storm right now. I'm just gonna get right into it. Uh, Danny from New Jersey, take it away. Thank you so much. How are you, my poet friends? I am so excited to see you. It's been a couple of weeks and I have some really exciting things to show you. If you obviously haven't noticed, I have a very special guest with me. Um, this is Simon and he is a lesser yellow headed vulture um, from South America. This is such a cool animal. You can see he's flapping around a little bit. You know what, I'm gonna take my hat off even though my hair is kind of crazy right now because I think my hat is kind of scaring him. So I'm gonna take that off um, just so he's not as worried. Now this is Simon and he is, I said, a lesser yellow-headed vulture. Now this is cool because this is one of actually the smaller vulture species in the world. It's actually the smallest, right? And um, where we live in Jersey, we do have two types of vultures. We have uh, turkey vultures and black vultures, which you'll often see soaring. They have some of the most important jobs in the animal world. Now let's take a look at him really quick. I'm gonna just calm him down over here. Come on, it's okay. Simon is getting to know me today, so Simon's a little on the nervous side, but it's okay. So let's take a look at the vulture and some important parts of the vulture. <laughs> there we go. Come on, buddy. Let me just let him settle down a bit. Okay, there we go. So the first thing you notice is that head, that incredible head, and that's what sets him apart from other typical birds that are carnivorous birds. Vultures are, um, they are, hi, scavengers, which means that they primarily eat dead animals. They usually don't kill things themselves and eat it, but they do eat meat all the time. So what they do is they have an amazing sense of smell. They have, you can see his face is very different from other birds. He's got very big nostrils and they have an amazing sense of smell. They can actually smell animals that are dead from miles away and then find them. They tune in, they fly around, they smell them and then they can see them with that really great eyesight and they'll come down and land and start to eat the dead animals, right? Now this is a really important job because imagine if we didn't have a cleanup crew around that would take care of dead animals. We'd have some pretty messy things laying around, right? So the vultures are nature's cleanup crew. They basically come in and they eat all the rotting meat and animals and the food like that. So they provide a very important service. Um, and one of the specializations, one of the things that makes a vulture so different and so well made for this kind of, of um, lifestyle is that head. You notice something different about that head, right? He's got no feathers at all in the head. And there's a reason for that. See, this guy's gonna spend a lot of his time sticking his head into dead animal bodies to pull out all the good meaty bits, right? Um, if he had a lot of feathers on his head, that would get messy really soon. They'd have blood and pore and all kinds of stuff on their heads. So having only skin around their heads helps them to keep super clean. They're amazingly clean animals. People think that vultures are actually kind of dirty or smelly because they're associated with dead things, but they're super clean animals. They are fantastic and they are a very important part of the ecosystem. Now you can say, um, Simon here, he is the smallest of his kind. He is a small vulture, but you can see he is still quite impressive, especially when he flaps like that. <laughs> We're gonna let him calm down a little bit. There you go. Um, especially when he flaps like that, you can appreciate these giant, giant wings on what is supposed to be a small bird, right? And there's a reason for those wings. They don't fly and they don't flap around like most other birds. Vultures especially are experts at riding warm temperature currents and they can ride these currents for miles and miles and miles and never have to flap their wings even once. So this way they can save on a lot of energy and allows them to travel really far distances. And he's obviously saving his energy for me, right? Um, okay, so this is a really amazing animal. The next time you happen to see a vulture in the wild back in New Jersey, I want you to remember Simon and what an amazing animal it is and appreciate it, okay? I'm next gonna introduce you to another really spectacular animal. This is possibly one of my favorite birds of all time. Now I'm gonna introduce you to two very special individuals. Number one is my good friend, Lewis here. We're gonna have Lewis step in. Um, Lewis is hosting us here in Florida and he is the owner of many of these really wonderful creatures. Up next, I'm gonna move out of the way so he can introduce you to one of his most special birds and he's gonna tell you a lot of interesting things about it. Hello. Let me just get the camera a little lower real quick. Sorry about the gentleman camera, guys. We'll be right on there. <laughs> there you go. All right. 
What's going on, guys? So, here I'm going to introduce you to Leonidas. Leonidas, he is an Eurasian eagle owl, one of the largest owl species in the world. He's about six years old, and now he's been with me since he was about two weeks old, a little baby, little fluffy owl. Now, these guys get full size by the time that they are about eight weeks old. Once they get eight weeks old, then they start growing their adult feathers that we can see right here. He weighs close to four and a half pounds, which doesn't seem like a lot of weight, but when you don't have motors and you have to fly, these guys are pretty big. Now, females get a lot bigger than the guys they that a lot bigger than Leo that you have here. They could weigh close to seven to ten pounds. So they're gonna be a little bigger than him. Now he's very curious. He's looking around everywhere around here, just making sure everything is good and everybody's having a good time. But well, he's a good little bird. Now his eyes, you guys see this big, beautiful eyes? Show me your eyes, Leo. Come here. There you go. She has big, beautiful eyes. Well, they look very similar to ours, but they're very, very different. Me and you have eyeballs where they could move side to side, up and down, and all the way around. These guys' owls, their eyes are more like a oval, right? So they cannot move them. They have to move their heads. And that's how they're able to look around because they can't move their eyes. Now, they cannot move their heads 180, uh, 360 degrees all the way around, but they can move their heads that far back. That's almost 180 degrees straight back so they can see their surroundings. Up here, these little feathers you guys see up here. Let me bring them a little bit down. These little feathers you see up here, those are called their tassels or their little horns. They're not their ears, and they use that for camouflage. Now, when they're hunting, they'll perch themselves up very high in a tree. And they'll try to fit in with the tree so that nobody can see them. And those little little ear things that has here, little tassels, they'll stick them up, and it looks like little branches. And the prey does not know they're there, and that's how he's able to get his dinner. Now his feet, his feet are very amazing and very very powerful. He has over 500 pounds of pressure per square inch in each one of his feet. Let me see if I can get his feet real nice so you guys can see him real close. You can see how big his talons are. They're right there. That's his nail. Look how big those things are, right? Look at those things. Now, me and you have fingernails. Bears, tigers, and lions, they have claws. And birds of prey have talents. And when they grab their prey with those big feet, that's how they're able to catch them and get their food. Another interesting and amazing thing about these guys is their feathers, especially on their wings. If you look very closely, let me see. Where are we going right there? There you go. You can see little ridges on their tail, on their feathers. Now, that creates the wind to go in a way where it doesn't create any noise, and they can stay super, super stealthy. They're almost like bam, I'm flying. Hey, yes, those are your feathers. And that's how their noise that they make is <laughs> very different than what we see on TV. Um, <clears throat> he's wondering, what happened, Leo? What are you looking for? Yes. Um, so their feathers, when they're flying, the air goes in a way where it doesn't create a lot of noise. They're the most silent birds in the world to fly around are actually owls. Hey, no, 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 you're gonna stay right here. We're hanging out. See, right now, Leo sees a little perch on the other side behind the camera. He's like, I wanna go over there, just like that. You're not going over there. Relax. There you go. <laughs> um, These guys can live up to 80 years old. 70 to 80 is the average size span they say that, that they can live up to. If you keep them healthy, Proper diet, proper enclosure, and very, very good. They can live a very, very long time. Now, not all owls are nocturnal. We usually think they only live during the night, but that is not true. Some are during the day, some are during the night. Leonidas, he is an Eurasian eagle owl. So he lives in Europe and Asia, very cold parts of the world, where half the year is light and the other half is nighttime. So he's adjusted to be able to hunt. Whether there's light or there's no light, these guys could be able to hunt. Now, if you see his face, what are you, Leo? You see his face is a little flat, and that's how he's able to hear. His ears, one earlobe is facing down, the other earlobe is facing up, and that's why he could hear all the way around. And he could see things. His face is flat, almost like a like this, so he makes noise to come back at him. He knows pinpoint exactly where that prey is. The little mousy, he'll go right there and grab his food. He also has about a six and a half to seven foot wingspan. I want to see if I can move the computer just a little further back. You guys can see his wingspan. Open up, Leo. There you go. Look how big his wingspans are. There you go. Not showing them your wings. <laughs> he thought it was go time. <laughs> but they're very amazing animals. 
And I have a special bond with this with the United States. Like I said, I've had him since he was a little baby. I raised him up. He spends all his time with me. We do get to travel a lot, do a lot of education and interaction all over the country. So he's used to being around people that does not bother him. Um, and he's one of our main ambassadors and most important birds that we have uh, to educate and to show people how these guys actually work. It's very, very different than what we see on television. The only thing about these guys is uh, they don't they don't deliver mail. <laughs> like in the popular movie Harry Potter, they're very different than what we see on that movie. Now, there's also another thing about his feet. I don't know if you guys saw it, but you see how fluffy those feet are, right? Now, these guys live in a very cold environment naturally, so right there it keeps them nice and warm. They are the closest living relative to the snowy owl, so they could tolerate very, very, very cold temperatures. They don't do very good in hot temperatures, so we have to keep them in indoors during the summer here in Florida, but in the wild where they live, they could be very, very cold, a lot of snow, and they'll do just fine. It'll be just another beautiful day for these guys over there. Now, I hope you guys enjoy Leonidas here. Just give him a big hand of applause. Leo, say bye-bye, guys. There goes his wave to you guys. And up next, we're going to have another amazing animal, very different than you already saw, Simon the Vulture or Leo the Owl. Here we go. i let you guys enjoy the fish tank for a second while I get our next friend ready. Sorry, buddy. This is Caesar, and he is a very active auger buzzard. Um, I wanted to introduce you to Caesar really quick because he's a pretty special bird. Um, back in Jersey, we often see red-tailed hawks. They are one of our most common birds of prey. Um, Leo here. He is actually a very distant cousin uh, to our red-tailed hawks from, from Africa. And he basically plays the same role over there that he does here, where they are predators on small mammals, um, different types of creatures, basically whatever they can catch. They're very efficient. They're very efficient hunters. Like most birds of prey, they have a really great bunch of weapons that they use to capture their prey. The first one you'll see is obviously, hey, how you doing, buddy? How's Caesar? Um, I'm going to try to calm him down over here. Caesar has this beautiful hooked beak, which you can see here. It has a very sharp hook at the end, right? And that's used for tearing off pieces of meat. They actually, their, their beaks are made in a very specific way that makes them really good hunters. When they capture an, an animal that they are going to eat, they're really quick at um, being able to, to kill it. And then that beak helps them to rip out pieces of meat which they will later, you know, kind of shred up and eat as they eat the animal, whether it's something like, for a red-tailed hawk, it'd be something like a squirrel, um, a, a rabbit. It mostly tends to be mammals for them. Um, so these guys, they have all that same equipment. Now, probably his most dangerous equipment are right here. I'm going to hold them up just a little bit. You can see uh, those feet. These feet, oh, this way. These feet are so incredibly powerful. The grip that they have is unbelievable. When they grab onto something, there's just no way you're gonna get them off. And at the end of each one, it's okay, buddy. At the end of each one of these toes, there you go, hi. At the end of each one of these toes is a very sharp talon, which I heard Lewis discussing with you earlier before. A talon is a really efficient tool um, at capturing. So they have these really long talons, these really long claws that when they grab, there's no chance you're getting away from them. That definitely secures their prey. They're really fantastic birds. As you can see, he's a pretty good sized bird too. He's about the size, maybe a little smaller than some of our red tails up north, but he's a pretty good sized bird. So a bird like this could really take advantage of a lot of different animals. And I can't even imagine all the different things that they would probably have access to in Africa. Some really choice foods, I'm sure. But what are some of the typical prey items for an auger buzzard that you would think of, you know, um, field mouse, wild mice, um, snakes. Small mammals snakes. mostly? Yep. It's okay, buddy. It's okay. So you could say, um, Caesar here is kind of learning. We're, we're both learning to, to be friends. Uh, this is actually kind of the first day I've been working with him, so he's a little nervous still, and that's why he's flying around. So we're going to actually move on. I'm going to move on because I don't want him to stress out too much. So I'm going to hand him off over here to Lewis, and then we're going to visit with some really fun creatures, okay? Just give me one second. I'm going to pass Caesar off over here. Thank you. 
There you go, buddy. All right. Now, we have visited with some of these before, but this is a really special animal I'm going to show you today. One of my personal favorites. Um, I think most of us are pretty familiar with lizards, at least from what we've seen over the past couple of months that I've shown you guys. We have some other really amazing um, creatures to show you today along those lines. This one is one of my favorites. This. Hi, buddy. This. Oh, let me turn around for the camera so we can see him in all his glory. This is a Cuban iguana. Um, it's a lot different from the regular iguanas that we usually see, right? Most of the iguanas that we see are the green iguanas, and they're a lot different. That's a totally different creature. The biggest difference is, is that the green iguanas tend to live in trees and climb most of their lives, whereas these iguanas tend to live mostly on the ground. They're actually called rock iguanas, which is more of their common name. This one in particular, this is a Cuban rock iguana, and they're from Cuba, and he's... Uh, not even halfway grown. They actually get pretty big and they get very heavy because of the fact that they don't spend most of their time climbing up into trees. Um, they tend to get really heavy and really big. So they're really bulky. They're built, they're built like tanks. They're actually kind of scary when they're big. That's not an animal I would want to mess with. They deserve a lot of respect, not only because they get big, but they have a lot of kind of powerful tools, just like our birds of prey did, right? They've got claws, which we can very easily see here. These claws are incredibly strong and powerful. And once again, that's because this animal tends to live on the ground where it uses those claws to dig holes and dig burrows and move giant rocks around and burrows. So it's built a lot differently. And because of that, they're also very strong. Their arms and their legs are a little shorter than a typical green iguana. And as you can see, they're very stocky. Um, I love these lizards, they're always so great. Um, they're really special in a lot of different ways. Most of them come from the Caribbean, which are islands in the southeastern portion, uh, close to the southeastern portion of the United States, places like Cuba, um, the uh, Cayman Islands, all these cool little islands. And there's all these different species of rock iguanas that live there. One of my favorites are the ones that live in the Cayman Islands. They are actually kind of famous because they look exactly like this, but they are an amazing blue color, like just an incredible blue color. You wouldn't even realize that a lizard is capable of having that color because blue is not a common color in nature. So that makes them really special. Unfortunately, though, the ones that live in the Caymans only live there, as most of these do. Most of these iguanas live on islands, and they only live on those islands and nowhere else. So, of course, that makes it a little bit dangerous to live where they do because if a big hurricane comes across or something that can kind of devastate all the habitat, that's it. There's nowhere for them to really go for the most part. Um, the Cuban iguana, like this one, it's a protected species, and it's being monitored to make sure that they don't lose a lot of habitat and the population stay healthy. But as I said before, ones like the Cayman blue iguanas, they're an endangered species. There's actually very few of them around, and there are some important breeding programs going on to make sure that they are going to be around for years to come. Unfortunately, the breeding program has not has had um, a couple of major problems. Um, they have been doing really well with reproducing animals and being able to return them to the wild. But one of the main issues that these lizards are having in the wild is the fact that stray dogs tend to dig up their nests or eat the babies, which is a big problem on these islands, especially in the Caymans. And the Cayman Island iguana has a special breeding program that's been going on, and they were doing really well for a long time. And then unfortunately, about two years ago, a bunch of dogs, wild dogs, um, broke into the breeding facility and ended up killing a lot of the breeding adults. So they're kind of starting that program over again. And in the meantime, we have to be very careful to protect these animals because once they're gone, they're gone. There's no way of bringing them back. But in a weird way, as much as some of these are protected and endangered, um, ones like this, like the Cuban iguana, are incredibly common. Uh, these are really commonly sold as pets because they do make actually really good pets. Um, and they are sold as pets frequently. But this guy, specifically the Cuban iguana, has managed to go places where they don't belong, places like here in Florida and places like Puerto Rico, where they have established themselves and they're considered an invasive or a pest species. And that means that while they're there, they're causing damage to the ecosystem, they're competing with animals that were there first or don't know how to compete with them. So they tend to cause a lot of problems. It's actually interesting that in some of the islands um, in the Caribbean, actually here in the United States too, people have started to eat iguana because they're so plentiful that they become an actual food source. And I, although I have not had it myself, I'm told that it's not a bad meal. 
So um, it's an interesting kind of thing that's arisen from these animals moving into places where they don't belong. Of course, humans are kind of trying to find a way to battle that. So I don't know how successful it will be because especially here in Florida, there are a lot of animals that don't belong here or are invasive. They weren't originally from Florida. Things like pythons and a million kinds of lizards, dozens of birds. There's just so many weird things running around in Florida. If you ever get to take a vacation in Florida, you might see some of these amazing creatures, right? Um, but there are things like pythons, if you can imagine that. I've shown you guys some pythons in the past. Those are Burmese pythons, just like those. Those are running around in the Everglades here in Florida, which is kind of crazy. Imagine being able to drive down the road and see a 15-foot python cross the road in front of you. What would you do? You get out and hug it? That's what I would do, right? So uh, it's really amazing how these animals are kind of changing the world. And I think we have to learn to just change with them um, because it's, it's, there's not much we can do with them. We're never going to get rid of them. They're going to be here pretty much forever at this point. So it's something that we're going to have to get used to. But we'll talk more about invasive species at another show sometime, and I can give you guys some other really amazing examples. Um, I'm going to move on. I'm going to show you something really cool. Um, do you, do I, do you want to grab the, um, the prop? Great. Um, well, I'm going to get this guy ready and get him put back. Lewis is going to do me a favor and grab something really special. I want to show you this because it is not only the like typical kind of swamp creature, but this one in particular is super special. And I'll explain to you why in just a second. So we're going to put this guy back. I want to say goodbye to him. Wave goodbye. Bye. Okay, I'm going to put him back. And then we're going to move on to our next creature, which I think you guys are really going to like. We're very lucky that we can come down here and visit with these cool creatures that we normally don't get to see. All right. Now check this guy out. This is JJ. Relax, JJ. JJ is a little guy. He's only about three years old. And if you're wondering, this is a crocodile. This is an African dwarf crocodile, the smallest crocodile species in the world. Now, you guys see him very closely. This little guy looks a lot different than alligator and the most crocodiles you see. We believe that all crocodiles are very, very big animals. They're not. Some are very big, some are different, small. Just like this little guy here, he's a little dwarf. Now, where this guy lives in the wild, this guy is very, is very different. Doesn't live in open water or lakes or the ocean like the saltwater crocodiles or in the swamps like we have here in Florida with the alligator. This guy lives in the forest, dense forest, and they spend a lot of time outside the water. And they do most of their hunting at night. That's why these big, big eyes. When they get adults, they're very big, black eyes so they can see at night a lot easier and they catch their prey. Now, when they're this small, they eat little things like crickets and little beetles and bugs and small snakes and small little fish that come by them. Once they get bigger, they'll eat, obviously, a, a lot bigger prey, but nothing too big. The biggest these guys get on record is about six feet long. So it's not big compared to most crocodilians. Like I said, these guys are the smallest of all crocodile species in the world. Now, if you guys see the back of his body, you can see those osteo osteoderms. And that's why they get their heat and also it protects them like armor. It's very, very hard. It's not very soft. Their bellies are very, very soft. You can see their scales in their belly. It's very, very soft. Up here is very rough and very hard. And that protects them from predators when they try to grab them. They see that hard thing like, oh, that's a shell. I don't like it. It's too strong for me. I'm going to move on. Their head, they do not have any type of body fat on their skull. The way you see, if you were to take it off, that's exactly what you were getting. It's not like our bones. It's not like our bones that we have all this meat and we can't see our bones. This guy's head is very, very different compared to that. Now, if you can see their feet, they have web feet, almost like ducks. See that? Hello, guys. Now, that's how they're able to swim maneuver in the water. They're walking in the water, going like this, and with a very powerful tail, they move it side to side, and that's how they project themselves to get where they're going to be. With their feet, they use more like paddles to be able to move the direction. They're going to go right or left or anything like that. And that's how they're able to move around the water. Now, let's see if we can see these little guy's teeth. I'm going to do something a little dangerous. Hopefully, he doesn't get my fingers. But let's see if we can open his mouth. Open up, JJ. Open up. There you go. You can see his very sharp teeth. And that's how they catch their prey. Now, their teeth are not meant like lions and tigers. They're meant to rip things apart. Their teeth are meant to crush. So they get their prey with those teeth, very powerful jaws. 
They crush their prey, and that's how they're able to eat it whole. And these guys have over 80 teeth. I don't know if you could count them, but I can't count that high. So I'll leave that up to you guys to do. But you see it's beautiful. I think it's a smile. But if I were to put my finger there, you guys will laugh at me because I'll be screaming. <laughs> and we definitely do not want that. So these guys are very amazing, very rare animal. You very rarely ever see these guys around. So it sure is a treat to have them around and part of our collection and helping us educate ourselves about different crocodilians from different parts of the world. So this is a very special gift and amazing. I'm very proud and happy to have JJ here with us and introduce him to you guys. So we'll say goodbye to this little guy right now. We'll say goodbye, guys. And then up next, we're going to have an animal that I think he's Danny's twin. So we'll check him out. All right, Pac. I'm going to give you a dose of reptile cuteness because you deserve it. This is a red foot tortoise. Now, I've shown you guys a lot of really cool turtles over the past few weeks and months, but I wanted to show you a tortoise, which is a little bit different from what I've showed you in the past. In the past, we visited with things like alligator snapping turtles that tend to live in the water. Tortoises are different from that. Tortoises live on the land, and it's quite obvious when you look at their feet. Look at those feet. They look a lot like elephant feet almost, right? And that's because they are made for a walk-in, and they are really good at it. These feet allow them to be like little miniature 4 by 4 trucks in the rainforest where they live. They can climb over branches, run up a hill, go downhill. They could even swim if they had to, um, although they tend to stay out of water for the most part. They live near it. They don't go into the water as much as a turtle would. They like to dip and take baths every now and then and eat some of the cool stuff that grows near the water's edge. But for the most part, they don't swim around like turtles do. They just kind of hang out on land and travel the forest eating fruits, vegetables, and all kinds of greens they find along the way. And just like our friend the vulture, they might occasionally eat something dead that they come across, which once again is a good thing. We love our scavengers, right? Um, but they're pretty fantastic. And the fact that they have their shell with them means that they don't have to return home. They can wander for miles and miles and miles and they carry their home with them. They carry their protection with them. And as you can see, if he was to get scared, he can, let's see if we can climb up a little bit here for me. He can kind of hide in his shell and his legs form a pretty strong barrier in the front there that would keep animals from getting in there, keep animals from getting in there and grabbing his legs or grabbing his hand. And if you kind of close the front up, a lot like our box turtles do if he wanted to, to protect himself. Um, but they're pretty outgoing. As you can see, he's not gonna stay in there very long because he's a happy guy and likes to hang out with everyone. Um, they are, they're pretty fantastic animals. And of course, they, you know about tortoises. Um, we've discussed this in the past with the turtles as well. They do live for a long time. We're talking about decades, 40, 50, 60 years. Years plus they're very long with creatures this is actually a very young animal this one's only a couple years old um, they get to be about three or four times the size they get to actually be pretty big tortoises for the most part although they're considered kind of the smaller tortoises in the world um, they're pretty fantastic and one thing I forgot to mention is what makes them really successful as turtles and tortoises is that turtles rely on the water because if they stay out of water for too long they will become dehydrated tortoises don't they carry their water with them they have basically what's like a built-in water bottle if you can imagine that right they have this kind of a balloon that stores water with them so that when they go places, they don't have to worry about going too far away from the water at one time. Now for a species like this redfoot tortoise, which lives in the rainforest, that's not as much of an issue. It definitely gives them freedom to wander around and be a little more independent, but that's not as much of an issue for them. This is more important for tortoises that live in the desert. Um, tortoises that live in the desert sometimes don't get a chance to drink unless it rains or unless they happen across an occasional body of water. So they never know when their um, they never know when their next drink is going to come from. So they carry the water with them in a little kind of a balloon in their body, and as their body requires the water, they will start to use it up, which is pretty fantastic adaptation for this animal, considering that its closest relatives completely rely on living and swimming around in the water. These guys have learned to take off, to leave the water, climb the land, and take way more advantage of all the things that grow around the land and they can kind of they can explore. Um, all right, guys, this is the last animal I have for you today. 
If you have any questions and you want to kind of catch up with me on the comments, please feel free to do so. Um, as usual, if you have any questions at all, you can always feel free to um, contact me and I will gladly answer your questions on some of these really fantastic animals that we've visited today. So thank you very, very much, Park. It's always wonderful to be with you. I can't wait to bring you some more stuff and hopefully I'll see you guys in a couple more weeks with some more incredible animals. Thank you guys. Have a great rest of the week, everyone. And from me and Lewis, we love you guys. Take care.